I tend never to listen them back. Let's see. Ah, uh, okay. I've got kind of a list of questions, but um, you make oft, often work comparison when keep, keep, keep the lights down uh, against the enemy submarines and uh, the rationing of food uh, and so on and so forth. Um, are we in a warlike scenario, uh, climate change speaking? Well, yes, in the sense of the stakes. Yeah. You know, uh, a way of life is at risk. <laughs> life itself is at risk. But the difference is that we are um, on both sides of the uh, battle. Yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, which is psychologically very complicated. It's easy yeah. when you can envision an enemy and hate an enemy and feel superior to an enemy <laughs> um, one of the things that's so difficult about climate change is how it um, doesn't it can't be easily um, captured in our imaginations <laughs> and when we are in the moments when we are able to visualize it, we don't like what we see. You know, I don't like it. Yeah. You don't like it. Nobody yeah. likes it. Well, you know, one of the kind of... When I began writing this book, I said yeah. was, I had yeah. something quite different in mind. Yeah. I thought that I was going to be saying something to other people. Yeah. And as it turned out, I had something to say to myself. Yeah. You know, and the argument that the book... Um, details or shares yeah. is an argument that I'm having with myself because the more I thought about it the more confused I was by my own reactions and the more disappointed in myself I was and I, and I certainly felt that I wasn't in any position to tell anybody else anything other than to share my own struggle yeah in fact there's there's a, a moment in the book in which you, you talk to yourself yeah <laughs> Yeah, that was actually my favorite part of the book. It was, <laughs> in a way, the hardest to write because it was embarrassing, actually. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can. But I can uh, it feels good to confront even a difficult truth. Yeah. Yeah, this difficult truth would, would, would lead us to an inconvenient truth, but we will talk about it later. Um, a major, a major argument is that there is a big gap between comprehension and uh, action. Uh, how can we conflate the two aspects? Well, it's a very strange thing. You know, I think we're in America at least, yeah. and I assume it's the same in Europe. We're very used to drawing a sharp line between people who believe in climate change and people who don't believe in climate change. Yeah. And what we mean when we say that is people who believe in the science, you know, people who believe that human activity is leading to global warming and extreme weather. Yeah. And we tend to take satisfaction in being on the right side of that divide. The problem is, there are two problems. One, we're dramatically overestimating the importance of the other side. You know, in America, about 16% Uh, of the population denies climate change, which is smaller than the number of people who deny evolution or deny that the Earth orbits the sun. So there is a very broad consensus. You know, yeah. we can't have an elected president these days with more than 40% of the vote. <laughs> and, um, and yet 84% of Americans believe in human-caused climate change. So, but it feels good to point a finger of blame and to overestimate the importance of those other people because of the, the second reason, which is that isn't really the distinction that matters. Nobody, the universe, the planet, our grandchildren don't care about what we feel. You know, they care about what we do. 
um, as I wrote in the book a little bit, yeah. and it's just a sentence or two about um, Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos. And, you know, I said, do the kids who are being cured of malaria because Bill Gates gives away 46% of his income, his, his uh, money, do they care that uh, if he feels good or bad? And do the people who die because Jeff Bezos is, is only giving whatever it is, yeah. 4 or 6%, yeah. uh, do they care if he feels good or bad? Feel, it's actually a very um, Jewish idea, <laughs> which is that um, we shouldn't overestimate the importance of our feelings, feelings. Um, because our, our, who we are is determined by what we do. So when it comes to climate change, there's a problem that we've mistaken our feelings for doing. You know, We believe that to acknowledge that humans are causing climate change is itself to do something. And it's not, it's just an acknowledgement of science. Um, so what's tricky is normally when you're asking somebody to do something, first you have to convince them, you know, that, that something needs to be done and this is the thing. In this case, generally speaking, most everybody knows that we need to do something. And in fact, that's an expression you hear over and over and over again. And it's almost like the anthem of our historical moment. We have to do something. We have to do something. We have to do something. We have to do something about Trump. We have to do something about, you know, nationalism. We have to do something about uh, racism. We have to do something about climate change. We have to do something about healthcare in America. We have to do something about Brexit. We have to do, you know, the list is very long. As if putting that slogan on a t-shirt were to do something. Calling, you know, if you scream, there's a fire, it's not the same as putting water on the fire. Uh, And we are, as a culture now, all screaming fire. And while we scream fire, we're throwing more sticks onto the fire rather than throwing water onto the fire. So, you know, part of the problem is that, as we were saying, it's very hard to visualize. It feels abstract. It feels quite distant, like something that happens on the other side of the planet or happens in the future. There aren't iconic good guys and bad guys. It's just not easy to describe even what global warming is. Um... But then there is a part of the problem, which is that we have focused our attention in the wrong, to some extent, in the wrong places, or overemphasized, you know, fossil fuels, or overemphasized buying a hybrid car, or recycling, um, when there are much more important things that also happen to be easier to act on that we're not paying attention to. Um, you also say that in literature um, this, this theme is underrepresented, even if writers tend to be sensitive to the, to the topic. How, how do you explain that? Because it's not a good story. Yeah. Um, you know, a writer's primary purpose. Yeah, and then I will, I, will, I will link that to the second question. How can we make it a, a better story? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a uh, writer's primary purpose is to, is to tell a good story. Yeah. It, it, uh, I kind of wish that weren't true, but it is true. <laughs> Nothing can be accomplished if you don't tell a good story. Yeah. You cannot make a political point. You cannot move somebody. You cannot make them think about something. You can't entertain them unless you tell a good story. That was true 5,000 years ago, and it's going to be true in 5,000 years. And climate change, because it's so abstract because it's so boring, frankly, um, because it lacks moments of like uh, concrete drama, concrete suspense. It's not suspenseful to watch an ice cap melt. It is, it's literally the most yeah. boring thing you can imagine, right? Yeah. Watching water boil or watching ice melt. Yeah, but the, the fires in California were more dramatic. 
Um, do you think so? Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's very hard to make a direct connection between those and climate change for most people. Mm-hmm. Secondly, it's incremental. Like we've had fires before. This year they were a little worse. Hopefully next year they won't be as bad. Third, we have become used to them. You know, extreme weather. Yeah. It's just weather. That's what it is. You know, it's funny that nobody even bats an eyelash when you know we have a, a once in a century flood every year. <laughs> nobody like points out the fact that we need to either reinvent language or reinvent our notion of um, what weather is. <laughs> in terms of how to tell a better story, yeah, I don't have the answer. I mean, I think that. As with novels, different stories work for different people and we need to tell many different kinds of stories. So some of them will be fact-based, some of them will be manifestos, some of them will be quite personal, (laughs) Uh, some of them might be kind of science fiction, apocalyptic, some of them might be um, films or songs or, you know, as I say in the book, we're very far past the point of either or and we, we need to be into the mode of both and hmm. so it's not either I recycle or I fly less either we try to force governments to legislate or we act as individuals either uh, someone tells a story that's journalistic or someone tells a story that's personal we really need to be doing all of this at once because this is a crisis that's time sensitive you know the uh, we will not get a second chance to correct what we do now or what we don't do now. Yeah. Uh, among the many interesting parts of the books, there, there was this this sub subplot of uh, Claudette Colvin versus Rosa Parks that I didn't I wasn't aware of. That. Yeah, neither was very, I. <laughs> very very interesting. I mean. It's a little story that illuminates how storytelling works and, and how successful storytelling works vis-a-vis of not so successful. Um, what does it teach to us, this, this story? Which has nothing to do with kind of shame, but yeah. the, the mechanism. I think just that we have to be sensitive to the effectiveness of stories. Like different stories work in different ways. If I say to you, for example, let's, let's talk about, let's get right to the heart of the matter and talk about meat for a yeah, minute yeah. if I say to you um, are you some kind of uh, oh here's a here's a great example actually for eating animals my book yeah. um, J.M. Kotsea wrote a blurb for the book yeah. and he said um, you would have to either be without a mind or without a heart to read this book and not change the way you live and I remember my publisher at the time said ah, I don't know that's you risk insulting people you risk uh, and th- I, I get what they meant like we decided to keep his words because he is who he is and I was grateful but yeah. if I were to say to you we can imagine how coming on strong or coming on coming on forcefully or coming on generously or with humility can make a difference so if I say to you you do realize that you're torturing animals and destroying the environment and you're no better than Trump right now when you eat a hamburger, uh, my guess is that's not going to be a very successful mode of storytelling. Yeah. If I say to you, oh my God, your hamburger looks so good, I wish I were eating that right now, <laughs> you might say, well, why aren't you? Yeah. And I would say, well, I've been thinking about this stuff and it's made me want to try to um, moderate how much I eat and man, I wish I could be joining you at that, but <laughs> For now, at least, I'm trying to do this. I don't know. We'll see how it goes in the future. My guess is you would find that much more approachable, and you might be led into it rather than pushed away from it. So in the case of the civil rights movement, Rosa Parks, it was believed, was a character who would bring people into it rather than risk creating a kind of distance. So it was like a a very deliberate and thoughtful choice. Um, And still, a kind of... Not, not fake news, but the little manipulation. It's all manipulation, yeah. in the, in the yeah. sense that stories yeah. are, are the stories that we choose to tell, yeah. right? Yeah. So, uh, it's something I often talk about. I teach writing at NYU, 
Yep. And oftentimes with my students, I'll say, why does it begin here and end here? And why, why, why is this the story? Because when we tell a story, there's a great um, anecdote about Jackson Pollock, uh-huh. you know, the painter. Yep. And uh, uh, he would paint out in the Hamptons. Yeah. And he would roll out these enormous swaths of yeah. canvas. Yeah. Like huge. Yeah. 30 yards by, 30 meters by 60 meters. I mean, really huge. Yeah. And walk all over and paint the whole thing. Yeah. And then uh, when, it, when it was done, he would, uh, sorry, feet, not meters. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. It was That's a, re- a little too re- big. Re- yeah. too much, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> when he would, he would walk over and say, ah, here's a painting that's two feet by three feet. And here's a painting, and he would they literally cut it out, cut it out. and then yeah. put it on a stretcher. <laughs> and stories are exactly the same. I mean, the world is happening, and when we tell a story, we're choosing to cut out a piece of that reality and yeah. present it. Yeah. So whether it's Rosa Parks or Claudette Colvin, either one is going to be, yeah. Claudette Colvin wasn't everybody, she was yeah. just a representative yeah. of a struggle. Um, so anytime a story is being told, we're making choices, and in that sense you could say it's fake. Yeah. Um, but there's of course a difference between making a choice and telling a lie. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, this- this is very useful and it applies to so many, so many things in life. That, You're doing yeah, it right now. Yeah, yeah, of course, <laughs> of course, of course. There's, there's no doubt. Uh, another important part in this block of storytelling is that as, a, as human beings, we tend to discount the future. You know? there, then the Kahneman has taught us, I mean, among others. How can we counter that? I mean, uh, you, you seem to suggest that we have to look at, we have to point, identifiable victim, uh, a restricted group getting, uh, the, the perspective is getting worse. I mean, how do we counter this human tendency to this kind of future? So my little brother, who you've never spoken to, <laughs> wrote a book about memory. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a great book. Yeah. And I once said to him, you know, I have a real problem remembering people's names. <laughs> um, very, very hard time with it. Is there like a secret you could tell me, you know? <laughs> And he said, there are, there are techniques, but I'll tell you what the best technique of all is. And he says, it's going to sound like I'm joking, or it's going to sound like I'm saying nothing. But I'm telling you, this is the best technique. Try. And I was like, what? And he said, when someone tells you their name, say, I am going to remember this name. I'm going to try to remember this name. Um, it's something that you have to regularly do. So I think that there are a lot of techniques to make us care about the future Um, and you know people have studied these techniques quite specifically like social social scientists Um, I think the great trick is to regularly try and that's sort of what I came to at the end of the book like this is not a conversation we have with ourselves once and change our minds and we live it out like I am not going to um, set a building on fire, right? That's a decision I, I suppose I made once in my life. I don't have to keep revisiting that decision. It's very easy for me. I'm not tempted to. Things like eating differently. I don't believe it's a decision most people can make once. I think, I know it's not a decision I can make once, you know, despite yeah. having like written now two books yeah. on the subject, <laughs> I literally have to think about it every single time I eat. That might sound crazy, but I, I believe that for as long as I live, I will think that meat looks good and smells good and I will have a desire to eat it. I just don't see myself reaching a point where I get over that. And I think it would be disingenuous to pretend that it's easier than it is. So I'm committed to having this conversation with myself. And it kind of sucks, you know? It's kind of unpleasant. On the other hand, look how lucky we are to live in the world that we live in. And to be able to be outside, to be able to live in coastal cities, to have life expectancies that are as long as they are to have the kind of biodiversity that we have, those gifts, we're just too used to them. So they become invisible to us. And instead, what feels like a massive diminishment or a massive ask is 
like, could I have a vegetarian pasta instead of a ragu? Uh, you know, that feels like a major crisis. Uh, if, if someone said, if there really were a way to hold in your mind, and I don't believe there is, but if there were, to say, would I trade this meal for like all of that? Everybody would say, yes, of course, of course you would. It's just that you have to force yourself to ha- make that equation and to have that argument with yourself. <laughs> Yeah. Put this way is very convincing. Yeah, I mean, that you still have to repeat it to yourself, of course, because uh, uh, we tend not we tend not to do it. Um, let's swi- uh, switch to the inconvenient too. That that was a, an important moment for yourself. I mean, for for your awareness. Absolutely. Right? It was, I thought it was a very very yeah. powerful movie. Yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, uh, I, I I thought that it was a kind of life-changing event vis-a-vis yeah. of my awareness for this uh, story. But it wasn't a full story. Why? Well, I mean, anything I say has to be in the context of remembering that yeah. it really was the beginning. Yeah. So it's a very different thing to try to open a conversation <laughs> than it is to try to expand the conversation. <laughs> so I, if I sound critical, I'm really not being yeah. critical. I'm yeah. just expressing that we're in a different place yeah, now. Yeah. Um, he was very good in that film with raising awareness and concern. It wasn't very good with, with making specific asks of the audience, um, which is a shame because he earned it. You know, at the end of that, I remember the feeling at the end of that movie so well that everyone I've ever spoken to who's seen the movie felt the same way, which was like, yeah. what can I do? Tell me what to do. I'll do it. I will literally walk out of this theater and do what you tell me to do. Um, I went to a Bjork concert the other night. And uh, I think in between the, at some point in the show, it's like in, in between the show and the encore, um, Greta Thunberg, you know, you know her, the Sweden, they had a video of her speaking to the audience and everybody was applauding and going crazy and she didn't ask anything and you know I think she's arguably the most important person alive right now Um, but because of the goodwill that she has earned and because of the faith that people have in her she could really ask a lot so if she had Instead of just saying, this is an important problem, we need to work on it. You know, everybody's left like, okay, I'll applaud and maybe that will, that will be working on it. Applauding, yeah, it feel, literally feels in it. If she had said, everybody in this theater is going to go out to dinner after the show, do not eat meat. Do not eat red meat. Yeah. I am asking you, do not eat red meat. I bet you something approaching 100% of the audience would have listened to. Because we wanted to, yeah. you know? Yeah. Because, not because we were taking an order from somebody more powerful, but because we were expressing camaraderie with someone that we believed in and trusted. Yeah. So I think we're now at a moment where we need to make very specific prescriptions, you know? We need to be honest about what is asked of us, which is scary. I remember when I was writing this book, I was in conversation with scientists a lot, and um, you might remember there's a section that's, that's sort of all statistics. And yeah, yeah, I wanted to tell you yeah. about that because I think it's a risky, yeah. it's a risky uh, section, no? because you, you yourself say, I mean, it's, uh, we have to be careful with the storytelling and that's, you, you're asking a lot to, to the reader. Right? Yeah. There's some, so much data that yeah, you, yeah. You, you risk losing the reader. Yes, well, yeah, please, go ahead. So there's that part yeah. at the end when I talk about the average um, carbon foot budget, the average yeah. Budget, yeah. budget yeah. for yeah. Um, for the average global citizen yeah. is something like 2.3 tons per year in order to reach the Paris goals. Yeah. The the current um, footprint of the average global citizen is 4.3 three, something like that. And by not eating animal products for breakfast or lunch, we can reduce it about halfway. Yeah. So, okay, that's really inspiring. That's cool. I like (laughs) like to read that. The problem is different countries have different um, 
carbon budgets. Yeah. So an American's, you know, a Bangladeshi's is, I think, 0.29. Uh, uh, an Italian's might be more like six or seven or eight. And an American's is like 19. So if you think, how do you get from 19 to two? Yeah. You can't. It's literally impossible. Yeah. Um, when we're being honest about what's asked of us, it becomes, it's not a little bit of recycling. It's not a little bit of, it's not drying your clothes on a line instead of in the dryer. And it's not even buying a hybrid. It's like a, a truly radical behavioral revolution. Um, certainly for Americans, it will be. And it will require some really broad rethinking of like what it is to have a military you know which is an enormous carbon uh, expense um, you know what kind of cities we build um, so the information can be both inspiring and quite yeah. depressing as for that section um, I was doing my best to give the absolute bare minimum yeah. of information <laughs> to make my argument possible. You know, I don't want anybody to just trust me that, um, to trust me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I think a lot of people, myself included, need a kind of primer for, for climate change. Like, yeah. just, this is what it is. This is how it happens. This is what the relationship to food is. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of things that we kind of think we know, but we don't really know. Yeah. And we don't know in a way that we could describe to others or to ourselves. And I wanted to establish um, as quickly as the I could. The ground yeah. work yeah. in a way. And if somebody sort of feels like, yeah, I get it, and they skip through that, yeah. so I'm fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. Similarly, if somebody says, whoa, you this is way too much. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I included a you know very very long bibliography yeah, at the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you familiar with Julia Olson, the the lawyer who's uh, representing uh, twenty Oregon kids? I'm uh, familiar again, with yeah, that yeah, class, yeah, with yeah, the case. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I've interviewed her a couple oh, yeah? of years ago, and herself said to me that, I mean, the, the turning point for her was the inconvenient, uh, inconvenient truth. Yeah. Uh, but then her and, and the kids, I mean, it was back then, yeah. I think it was two years ago, back in Eugene, Oregon. Uh, she, she was the first one, and other people who were working with her, to tell me that Obama, uh, for, uh, I mean, she was a, uh, a, demo, a, a Democrat, a voter herself, but she was the first one to point out to me that Obama didn't do enough, which was a novelty for me because I mean I, I thought many things about Obama, but not that it. Uh, you seem to confirm that in, in in the book. In which way, according to you, he didn't do enough? What what he could do more? Well, he did almost nothing. I mean, he had a Democratic yeah. Congress, yeah. Um, and he did almost nothing when he could have done something. It's hard to blame him after he lost the Congress, but. It's also hard to, I mean, we need to forgive ourselves for the past um, while also holding ourselves accountable in the present and for the future. And we live in a dramatically different culture than we did a few years ago, you know, when Obama was president. Yeah. Um, it's just the, the culture wasn't ready for it. You know, you have to remember, Obama didn't even endorse gay marriage until... Yeah well into his uh, adulthood yeah. in his political life we can look back and say what was wrong with him or we can like remember like the importance of the cultural climate and how quickly it can change so let me put it this way I think yeah. it is more important to the environment that Trump got elected than what Obama did or that Hillary would get elected. I don't think we would be experiencing the moment we now are if Hillary had been president because, <laughs> and believe me, I would have done anything for her to be president. I knocked on doors for her, and, but we would be complacent. 
like it's almost like uh, a Marxist idea that like you really do need things to get bad enough to inspire change, inspire the kind of desperation that's necessary for change. Um, I don't think high school. I don't think students would be boycotting class if Hillary were president. Um, I don't think you'd have you know the um, uh, extinction. Rebellion, I thought it's called. Yeah, yeah. in, yeah. in yeah. Um, Europe, if Hillary yeah. were president. So, yeah. and the damage that Trump is doing to the environment, if to be honest, is is like it's almost a difference without a distinction. Um, you know, his policies and Hillary's policies or Obama's policies, Trumps are undeniably worse. Yeah, but I mean, on this, about that. But on he's this, proud of being yeah, but that's, No, but again, that's the difference between feeling yeah, and doing. Yeah, in terms of what he's yeah, actually right. doing, yeah. he pulled us out of the Paris Accords, but we were never going to meet yeah. the Paris Accords anyway. Like, we had no chance. Yeah. We were not even moving in the right direction. Yeah. So, do we care that, like, Obama made us feel good about that? Yeah. Or do we care well, that... We go back to the... Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> what matters is what we do. Yeah. And, um, Are you next? You realize that you have a very strong, strange name, N E X T. That's your name, X. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, it's interesting. It's paradoxical, but very interesting. I mean, no, the, the yeah, fact that cool. uh, this bike is so vocal, and well, maybe maybe because of that, that no, help to because of because that, of yeah. that because of that it help mobilize uh, a generation. Possibly, I mean, you know, imagine if you have. Hillary saying climate change is one of the great struggles of our time yeah. and not doing very much. Yeah. Should have done that. What is, what is that going to yeah. inspire? But when you see Trump write that climate change is a hoax, yeah. it arises, arri arises <laughs> something very, very powerful. Yeah. Um, I have not a lot of faith that leaders are going to bring us to where we need to be. You know, corporations sell what people buy. Politicians sell themselves. You know, literally. They are elected when people vote for them. So when behavior is changed on the ground or when the conversation is changed on the ground, it will demand change up above. And that will happen much more quickly than if we, what, you know, write letters to our congressmen or... You know, how, I don't even know how that kind of change would even happen. Yes, you're right, but you you perfectly know that uh, I don't know the people he put on EPA, for instance. I mean, at the worst the deniers. I mean, th there's some damage that he can still do. Don't yeah, you think so? it, yes, I do. But you know, so they're deniers, and the yeah. people who Hillary would have put on are believers. <laughs> but what <laughs> is what is the practical difference between the denial and belief? Yeah. There, there is a difference. I'm not pretending that there yeah. isn't a difference. I'm saying we are really overstating the difference yeah. relative to what needs to get done. Um, what needs to get done is not to, you know, protect a, this national forest or that yeah. national forest. Or What needs to get done is a complete rethinking of our behavior and the connection between our behavior and yeah. our future. And it's easy to get, be complacent when you believe someone else is doing it for you or taking care of it yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go into the, 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 the more specific part. Um, we used to think, we, we still think, I mean, broadly speaking, that CO2 is the main culprit. Why do you say this is not the case? We are, we are looking at the, the wrong culprit. I mean, the, the major culprit is uh, methane and uh, nitrous uh, oxide. Well, I mean, Why? you could say that CO2 yeah. Yeah. is the main culprit yeah. in, in the sense that it is the um, predominant greenhouse gas, yeah. but it's not the most powerful one. And it's, it's yeah. not the only one, and it's not the most powerful one. Um, so what is meant by most yeah. powerful? Yeah. Like the way greenhouse gases work, the analogy I use in a book is a, it's like a blanket. You know, yeah. like you put a blanket over your body and it keeps the heat instead of like emanating from your body and escaping into the room, it holds it against you. Yeah. Um, as we, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap the outgoing heat and warm the planet. Yeah. Um, and disrupt, you yeah. know, ecosystems. Um, so, 
methane as a gas is 38 times as powerful at trapping heat. Um, well, depend, depending on the time frame that you're looking yeah. at. And nitrous oxide is um, even, even far more, more powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the problem is that we run the risk of slipping into these feedback loops where, um, you know, as, for example, um, as ice melts, it becomes water. So ice is white and reflective and sends the sunlight back, water is darker, land is darker, and it absorbs more heat, which increases the melting. So this is why scientists say we have this number of years to fix the problem. Um, there's a deadline because once we reach that point, then it will, whatever we do, it will be impossible to reverse. Um, so the most urgent needs to address are the ones that are biggest. Like imagine if your family were, um, you realized that you weren't budgeting your, your family life properly and that you were spending more than you were bringing in. So everyone sits down at the table and they say, okay, let's figure out what we can get rid of. We could get rid of our newspaper subscription, which is a hundred dollars a year, or we could get rid of our second car, which costs us $5,000 a year. (laughs) So clearly you should try to get rid of the $5,000 first. Um, you know, methane and nitrous oxide are because they're so much more powerful than the ones that are most urgent to address. It also turns out that they're the easiest to address because they are almost entirely the um, resulting from food choices. You know, if you decided that you wanted to reduce your carbon foot, your carbon dioxide footprint, there are things you can do, but it's not nearly as straightforward. Yeah. And a huge portion of the carbon that's sent into the atmosphere has nothing to do with your daily choices. Yeah. Um, it has to do with things, you know, uh, that are industrial. You, you say, rather than think about the factory, think about the farm. Yeah. Okay. We were, like, like the, the, the um, poster for An Inconvenient Truth. Do you remember what it is? Uh, yeah. It seems factory. Yeah, it's like two big chimneys with a swirl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And that, I think, is the image that's locked into the minds of a lot of people. That and polar bears on, you know, melting ice caps, looking for a place to... And those are incorrect and and really tragically counterproductive um, because instead what we want to look at are the... are animal factories. You know, not industrial factories and not animals that are far away, but animal factories, the animals that are close to home. Um, It's just less convenient to think about them. It asks something of us in a way that, you know, you look at those chimneys and you, what is your relationship to those chimneys? Like, what are you supposed to do about them? In a way, it's... The responsibilizing. I mean, you think it's someone else, someone else's problem. Yeah. I mean, you cannot, you cannot do anything about. Um, in, in, can you do a little primary? In how many ways animal farming is so harmful to the plant because of the cycle that it produces? I mean, so the United Nations, which is you know not an animal welfare organization. Yeah. Um, has said that animal agriculture is one of the top two or three causes of every significant environmental problem on the planet, both locally and globally. So air pollution, water pollution, deforestation, loss of biodiversity, um, the problem is not farming animals per se yeah. like we have done that historically without destroying the environment and it's and it's an oversimplification or a lie to say that it's just bad because it's not necessarily just yeah. bad it, but it is bad the way we do it and in a world of seven and a half billion people yeah. where 
we expect to eat a certain amount of meat every day, there is no other way to do it. Um, you know, so intensive farm. Right. So, you know, animal, farmers used to look at um, nature and try to replicate it as a model um, to basically create nature in the confines of a farm. And now a farm looks at nature as something to be overcome or opposed. So if animals naturally become pregnant every X amount of time, is there any way we can do it four times that often? Um, can we um, regulate the lighting um, inside a shed so that an animal believes the day is only 18 hours long instead of 24 hours long? So it goes through its cycles that much more quickly. Yeah. Can we feed them antibiotics? so that an otherwise unhealthy animal will resemble a healthy animal. Can we breed them to grow um, three times as fast on half yeah. as much food? Four kilos, is, I mean, tw I read the statistic in which uh, uh, chickens were less than one kilo 30 years ago and now they are three kilos or something. Yeah. I mean, they, they grew exponentially. They, they doubled in, a, yeah. in about a decade. Yeah. 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 Um, so there's all kinds of problems of raising animals in these concentrations. One animal, one, one problem which just isn't talked about that much is just the breathing of the animals. It sounds weird or silly, but um, the carbon dioxide that they breathe out. You know, some people would say, yes, but how can you include that? I mean, come on, they're just animals. Except that we didn't have all these animals on the planet until we put them there. And it is no different in any way If you imagine a cow breathing and you imagine the tailpipe of a car yeah. sending carbon dioxide out, those are exactly the same problem. You know, a human invention for human convenience or human preference is um, creating profound amounts of an unhealthy gas, greenhouse gas. Um, animals burp and fart huge amounts of methane. Um, And we've made it worse by feeding them. Instead of you know allowing them to graze on pasture, we feed them corn and soy, which make them burp and fart more, which creates more methane. Not to mention, in order to grow all of that corn and soy, we're clear cutting the yeah. Amazon, yeah. which both releases huge amounts of carbon when you burn the trees, but it also destroys what are what we call carbon sinks, you know, trees absorb carbon. So there's more carbon right now in the forests of the world than in all of the fossil fuel reserves in the world. It's a strange statistic to think about. Um, and uh, the trees of the world are capable of absorbing a, like a fourth to a third of all of the greenhouse gases, the carbon that we produce. So when you cut down trees, you're both, it's like a double whammy, you know? You're both releasing their carbon and destroying the ability to absorb carbon from other sources. Uh, and about 90% of the clear cutting of the Amazonian rainforest is just for either animal feed or for animals to graze. And it's something we don't need. You know, it's one thing if it's like a regrettable necessity. Uh, life is filled with regrettable necessities, but this isn't one of them. We do this because we feel like eating it. It's really that simple, because we prefer it. It tastes, <laughs> we'd rather have a burger than a... <laughs> a tofu. <laughs> you know, so I never love comparing it to tofu because yeah. <laughs> it creates this idea of like, it's like I never go to vegetarian restaurants, yeah. ever. Yeah. Um, because I don't like propagating that like, binary yeah. like you're this or yeah. you're that yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, every restaurant I've ever been to in my entire life I've been able to find something I like you yeah. know um, and I think we need to move away from thinking about it as like the tofu eating vegetarians over here and the meat eaters over here and instead think about it as the people who give a shit about the world and the people who don't give a shit about the world and the people who give a shit about the world aren't necessarily vegetarians. Yeah, of course. They're just people who are doing their best, you know, to, to care. And maybe they eat meat at dinner. Maybe they eat meat on Fridays. Maybe they eat it every day except for Friday, you know. But they're doing something to act on what they know. Yeah. Uh, 
So, you know, when somebody says, I can't become a vegetarian, I never ever would think or say like, come on, give me a break. <laughs> but if someone were to say to me, I can't reduce my meat consumption at all, I can't remove it from even one meal a week, then I would say, come on. <laughs> you know? And I say that as somebody who, in my own life, struggles with like reduction and struggles yeah. with acting on what I believe. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you convinced me totally. Uh, and I think that's the only way to, to be, behave like that. I mean, not being a Taliban, because otherwise you, are counter, you become counterproductive. It's kind of productive yeah. and it's narcissistic yeah. and it's dishonest because yeah. the fact is nobody's perfect. <laughs> you know, like I've yet to meet the person who does it right. Yeah. And um, even if they're getting their carbon footprint right, they're getting other things yeah. wrong. Like we all get it wrong and it's not, uh, we're so afraid of hypocrisy that oftentimes we'd rather, literally rather not try than be imperfect. You know, if the awareness that we can't get it 100% right makes us unwilling to get it 1% right. <laughs> and it's crazy. Yeah. You know, like it's something I often find myself saying is like, if you were to ask me, do I think half of America could be vegetarian in 10 years? I would say, I think there's zero chance of it. <laughs> Literally zero. Yeah. If you were to say to me, do I think half of the meals eaten in America could be vegetarian in 10 years? I would say I would bet on it. Um, I think that could be the case in five years. But it's the exact same outcome. It's just in one case we're talking about individual identities, and in the other case we're talking about choices. Um, not, not like choices of identity or choices of lifestyle, but just practical everyday choices, you know. Hmm. Um, I've yet to meet the person, and I've met all kinds of people, like since I started thinking and talking about this stuff, I've yet to meet the person who was incapable of imagining eating a little bit less meat. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And if everybody ate a little bit less, that would be a, a very big part of the solution. And the, the funny part is, we would be healthier, we would have more money in our pockets, we would feel better both physically and I believe like psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever the word you want to use is. I've had a lot of meals that feel good, you know, but I've never had a meal that feels as good as making a choice not to eat something because of my values. We're so used to thinking about like we live in a culture that's so consumerist driven, so consumption driven that we believe that always having more will always make us feel better and always having less will always make us feel worse. <laughs> um, and it's not true. And we're beginning to like learn that that's not true. We're beginning to learn that having more often makes us feel worse and having less often makes us feel better. And um, I don't know if you've had the experience in the last couple of years of ever making a choice um, against your like cravings whatever it is yeah. in the interest of your values but it feels awesome yeah. like I love traveling I decided this summer that I was going to take one less trip so that I would fly I would take two less flights you know there and back I love traveling I love seeing the world it's one of the greatest pleasures of my life it felt better to me to say no because I will have other opportunities to see the world and I'm not ruling out travel, just as I would, wouldn't suggest anybody rule out a food that they love. Yeah. Just reducing it. And it's a remarkable thing that it feels very like, sometimes creating constraints in your life makes you feel free. <laughs> Whereas having ultimate freedom makes you feel imprisoned. Like the tyranny of choice, you know? The tyranny of availability. I don't think Amazon makes everybody feel suddenly empowered. You know, like, I can have anything I want anytime I want. It's not, it's not empowering, it's disempowering. <laughs> There's a funny, um, apparent contradiction between the 
English version of your book and the Italian version. Meaning, the, the English version uh, says, says you can start from breakfast, I mean, to change, to change the world, right? While on the, on the Italian edition, is uh, you uh, possiamo cambiare il pianeta we can change the planet uh, uh, at, at before, dinner before dinner, dinner no? we, after dinner uh, let me see I, I thought it was it's also possible that they're still yeah working on that I know here I've got I don't have the title I got because in a way it suggests in the Italian in the Italian edition it suggests that uh, as, the, as the book does that if you slash your consumption, let's say you 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 don't eat meat twice, but you you half your your consumption, you can make a big difference. So you can maybe you can decide to to eat meat only at dinner. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, while the Ita the English version suggests that starting from the first breakfast, you have to change your your habits, which which would be more engaged, I mean... Well, so either way, more. what it's supposed to yeah, mean yeah. <laughs> is that we shouldn't eat it for breakfast or lunch. Yeah. So uh, whether it's you start what you're doing at breakfast yeah. or <laughs> you end what you're doing at dinner, yeah. okay. it's hopefully the same idea. Yeah. yeah. It's been really interesting, actually, how foreign... For whatever reason, my foreign publishers have very strong feelings about the title and <laughs> like what will work you know yeah yeah like, every, every publisher I just had a uh, long conversation with my French publisher <laughs> who was saying there's a lot of books about the environment they all use the word weather and climate and what's interesting about this book is this connection to food so that's what should be the title they should lead with that whereas in America for whatever reason there really aren't that many books about global warming yeah. um and so it, it, and there's uh, maybe more of a reticence about asking people to eat differently. I don't know. Uh, yeah, th there's a part of the book uh, in in which you counter the elitist argument because, I mean, you know. The U.S. much much better than me, so you are perfectly aware that in some parts of the U.S., uh, I, I've been once in West Virginia, and remember the desperation of not being able to find anything edible for my standards, which 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 isn't particularly, yeah, but it's a European standard, Italian standard. I was yeah. looking for for vegetables; it was almost impossible. Yeah. I can tell you. Um, but still, you say, yeah, um, you reply to the elitist argument saying that if you, if you want, you can find vegetables. Is that really true in all of the US or according to you? Can well, so I would say a few things. One is, no, yeah. it's, you can't find vegetables everywhere. Yeah. But that is not a reason to, for the person making the argument to continue eating meat. Yeah. That's an argument for the, a reason why that person should be working to make sure there's vegetables in West Virginia, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not a logical connection that they're yeah. making. So usually, when people talk about the elitism of the argument, yeah. what they really mean is it's more expensive. Yeah. And it's just simply untrue. Yeah. It's just factually incorrect. Yeah. Um, Harvard Medical School did a study in 2018. Yeah. So the most reputable institution yeah. and the most contemporary study found that it is more expensive to eat a healthy diet than an unhealthy one. That is true. Um, so, if you want to say it's elitist that people should eat healthy, I suppose you can say that. Although I would prefer to say everybody should have the right to eat healthy food, to have access to and be able to afford yeah. it. Um, what the study also found is that it's about $550 a year, which is a huge amount of money. Like 500? $550. Yeah. So the average, the, the median income in America is about 33000 yeah. 34000 So $500 is, is a lot of money. Um, and it found that um, the, an, the average vegetarian diet is about $550 cheaper than the average meat diet. And furthermore, um, it's about $200 cheaper to eat a healthy vegetarian diet than an unhealthy meat-based diet. Oh, much sure. So not, not only yeah. is like a vegetarian yeah. cheaper than yeah. meat, yeah. 
but it's $200 cheaper to eat a healthy vegetarian than an unhealthy meat. <laughs> so if, if we have a way of eating that is better for somebody's paycheck, yeah. it's better for their health, it's better for the planet <laughs> that we all share yeah. and live in, it's hard to understand what is elitist about that. I think what is elitist is when people use less fortunate people with fewer means as an excuse not to make changes in their own lives. When they say, well, there's somebody who lives in an inner city without access to vegetables, so I'm going to have my steak tonight, rather than saying, because that person isn't able to make the same changes that I am, I'm going to take on an even greater responsibility. You know, so which is, to seems to me the proper way to think about it. Yeah. It's, it's manipulative in a way. Extremely manipulative. It's also condescending to, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, use, using less fortunate people as a personal excuse. Yeah. That's definitely true for, for Italy. I, I can tell it for, as a fact. I mean, once I do, I, I, I live in Rome, very, very close to a, a farmer market. And I can buy tons of mm -hmm. good vegetables for, for nothing. I mean, for much cheaper than, than meat. Here, it, if I should do the same, I, I was spending one month and a half in October, last October, here in New York, and it became more complicated because I had to go to Whole Foods to, to buy reasonably good vegetables or to Italy, to name, I mean, yeah. which is a boutique, as you know, I mean, yeah. it's... But it's great. Uh, yeah, it's great, <laughs> of course, of, of course it is. Yeah, but th then in that case, uh, I would have, I wouldn't know where to buy reasonably good uh, vegetables in New York, apart from, also Union Square farmer market, it's not that cheap, to be but, honest. But again, you're comparing, yeah. like, if you compare vegetables at Italy yeah. against yeah. meat yeah. at Italy, yeah. Yeah. You still do better yeah, eating vegetables. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it's not yeah, fair it's to compare yeah, vegetables at yeah. Whole Foods or yeah, yeah. Italy with yeah. meat from, you know, uh, yeah. the corner store. Yes, yeah. you have to compare likes with likes. Yeah. 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 But you point at something which is true, which is we've sort of lost the culture of eating vegetables, and we've definitely yeah. lost the culture of cooking. Yeah. And it's one of the things that the industrial farm complex has taken from us yeah. you know um, 20 percent of meals in America are eaten in a car um, we eat vastly more chicken than we did a yeah. century ago yeah a century ago you would buy a chicken and like roast it in the oven yeah. and eat it at the dinner table with your family the chicken that we eat now is not that it's like eaten with the fingers of one hand while you drive it's just McNuggets that's all it yeah. is I think that, you know, what, one thing I would love, and that would be part of this broad solution, is in schools, we need to teach, even if it means teaching less math, um, we need to teach cooking. We need to teach kids how to shop for food, how to cook food, teach them about food health. Yeah. Um, because if, if you are, I mean, there are a certain number of Americans who live in what we call food deserts, you know, where yeah. they don't really have access yeah. to yeah. food. Many, many more Americans live in a kind of intellectual food desert where they just have no awareness of what kinds of foods exist or yeah. how to prepare them. Like, you know, to say that you can buy a pound of, you could buy farro beans yeah. and asparagus for less than... Um, a McDonald's hamburger is one thing, but ask the average person if they know what those things even are, or like, what would you do with them when you bought them, or how much do you buy, or how, you know. Um, so we need to rebuild a culture of food, and, you know, as with food production, it's, it's not like a reinvention, it's an uninvention. Yeah. It's not that we need to make something new and radical, yeah. we just need to go back to what we had 50 years ago. Hmm. Yeah, vis-a-vis -vis of this last phrase that you, you pronounced, I mean, there's a huge difference between the Obama presidency and the Trump presidency. I mean, Trump is a guy who, who makes 
uh, who's proud of themselves saying that he drinks seven cokes a day and he eats hamburger while Obama wanted I me mean, Michelle Obama called uh, um, Alice Waters to to, <laughs> <laughs> to to plant vegetables in the White House so I mean at least in that department the Obama administration was much much more an example to the Americans don't, don't you think so or? I agree but is that again is that a case of feeling or doing yeah. like It has certain optics, yeah. and I'm sure that to some limited extent it influences behavior, yeah. but not that much. Not on the scale of like, by the way, first of all, you know, Obama would call out for hamburgers as well, and would bring, yeah. Yeah. was I like remember. famous for bringing hamburgers to the yeah. White House for everybody, and going to like the Five Brothers hamburger joint, and yeah. um, Which is not to mention he also smoked occasionally while he was in the yeah. way. If you're talking about like optics for you know human health or being a role model, yeah. But I think that um, far, far more important. Yeah, but hamburgers are, are a political statement. I mean, in this case, was to say, "Huh, I'm a guy like you." I mean, I, I made Harvard. I, I attended Harvard, but I'm I'm a simple guy like like you. Don't you think? I mean, it's, it's a trick. The only it's, problem it's is to that, say, yeah, I mean, of course, it's a sentimental that, connection with you. Both the I sentimental mean, connection yeah. justifies extremely bad behavior. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, right. uh, yeah. not to draw a comparison where there isn't one, but that's how like fascism arose yeah. as well. Like, yeah. we understand each other. We have something <laughs> going on. You know, don't worry about what I'm actually doing. Just remember that I am like you. Yeah. yeah. Um, You know, I would have found it. Like, if you want to know what I find inspiring, it's yeah. not the Obamas, it's Beyonce, who huh. um, was in two. Do you know the Got Milk? Does that mean yeah. anything to you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She was in two of those ads, you know, 20 years ago, whatever. Yeah. That was a campaign that told a lie to the American public, which was you have to drink a certain amount of milk yeah. to be healthy, yeah. that your bones are going to be brittle if you don't drink enough milk. Yeah. Which is simply yeah. untrue. Simply untrue. Yeah, yeah. Not to mention um, huge portions of the population, like Jewish people and Black people, have a hard time digesting lactose. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, Michelle Obama, excuse me, um, Beyonce, yeah. is a huge advocate for a plant-based diet. Yeah. And they even she and Jay Z started this contest where um, people who um, make the change to eat a plant-based diet um, can win tickets for life to their concerts. Every concert they ever give, free tickets. And they have a really amazing website. Is it a prize? <laughs> yeah. Or a sentence? Uh, no, no, I don't I'm know. Joking. Joking. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of both, maybe. Um, they have a, if you look up something called the Green Print, uh -huh. they have a beautiful website that explains the connection between food and human cool. health and the environment. Yeah. And, Like that to me is inspiring and they're risking something every bit as much as Obama yeah. would have risked, you know? Yeah. But um, they're at the forefront rather than, they're at the front edge rather than at the back, the hmm. back yeah. edge. Yeah. Hmm. Um, talking about the remedies, there's, uh, you've, you got four remedies actually, not, not only a quasi-vegetarian diet which which you take not to the extremes as just you said before you say uh, less aeroplane flights um, less kids and less car is yeah. that correct? getting rid of the car yeah, yeah getting rid of the car. These, these aren't my opinions these yeah. are like yeah. very well established yeah yeah I have hard time uh, I've i think to, to sell these four points i think that the, the less kids it has a malthusian kind of aftertaste that it's uh, it's complicated to sell don't you think so yeah but well, especially you, you have got two so, yeah right? and i would love to have like six <laughs> i would also love to like yeah. fly in private planes yeah. <laughs> and i would love to like eat steaks every day we just can't yeah, yeah. you know um you know having, yeah, a, having a child so, sorry yeah Sticking to, to the point of the child, don't you think that this this argument, yeah, even if it's not yours, even if there's good science, it's it can sounds too drastic to kind of 
in a way eugenetic, but not for, for the kids, but eugenetic for the planet. So that you're ready to sacrifice. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Don't you think it's a, there's it's another a, it's a way? Of, there's another yeah, way of yeah, looking at it, yeah. which is not yeah. we have to stop having kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you were to say to most people, you can't have kids because of the environment, most people would not like that. Yeah. But what do you think, would you find it so abhorrent if someone said, have two kids, and if you want to have more kids after you have two kids, consider adopting. <laughs> like there are many, many children in the world who need homes, beautiful kids who would make you happy, who you, you would make them happy. I, it's like an understand, it is a, the most fundamental a lot of people experience it as the most fundamental, like evolutionary drive to have kids. Okay, we're not ta- we're not saying you have to go cut off your penis. We're saying like, do you need to make more people than like you can replace yourself? You know, I would say if somebody decided to adopt instead of have any kids, uh, you know, biologically, that's a beautiful decision, and the world is better for it. But nobody's talking about stopping people from having kids. Yeah, of course. It's all a question of like degrees and thoughtfulness and questioning your own choices like ultimately I don't think there should be laws about how much meat people should eat I don't think there should be laws about how many kids people should have I do think that was China yeah that, I mean not, yeah. not long ago yeah, I, I do I, I do think that we should consider like tax structures that like reflect the realities of the world like yeah. Um, I think it would be a good idea if there were, if we taxed things in some kind of proportion to their um, their carbon footprint. Yeah. Like that feels fair to me. I'm not just talking about food. Everything. Yeah. Like people should pay a tax on gasoline, on cars. People should pay a really hefty tax on airplane flights. And it seems fair to me that there's a tax on foods, whether they're meat or something else, that have a large carbon footprint. I also think it's fair that. Maybe to have yeah, it reminds me the nudge theory of yes, yeah. Sunstein in a way yeah. Yeah, to 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 gently He's push a vegetarian by the way ah. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever that's worth uh, and a very smart guy yeah yeah I've interviewed him in the past yeah, yeah. Um, I had a really funny conversation with him once <laughs> where uh, we were walking I don't know him really but we were one day I was walking with him and I said something like uh, I have to get home at five. I have a dog I have to take for a walk. And he said, you have a dog? And I was like, uh, yeah, I have a dog, you know. And he's like, you mean you live with a dog? You have a dog companion? And I was like, all right, fine, I, have, I live with a dog. And later we were talking and he, and he said, um, somehow it came up, he said, like, I have a girlfriend who, and I said, you have a girlfriend? <laughs> it was when he was just dating um, Samantha Powers before they were married. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, you got me. <laughs> he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a very smart man. <laughs> uh, okay, so not, not laws, but maybe tax structures in the way it can. But the most important thing is to make people make sure people are having the conversation with themselves. Yeah, but you know? but you know, I mean, you definitely know about that. That one of the reasons populists in Europe are winning now is that they are facilitating those who make more kids because they say. Ah, they want to replace us, they want to ethnically replace us. I mean, the, his, the Muslims are coming for us. And uh, in, in Poland, for instance, w- one of the top policy of the Kaczynski government was to give money, a lot of, gov- a lot of money for Polish standards for people who, who do more kids. I mean, a part of the world is going in the opposite direction. If, if, if it was for one of our vice prime minister, the, the, Lega North, the Lego one, real fascist to yeah. be honest with you uh, he would give me he keeps insisting uh, you Italians have to do kids because otherwise the Muslim will do I mean you are terribly against the tide I mean against the populist tide of course I do I do agree with you but I'm trying to to do a devil's advocate here uh, do you think that in this kind of mood international mood also Trump in a way I mean I don't, I don't say that he, he, he says uh, Americans do more kids, but I think he, he, he would be able to, to say that. And it, it was a, a message that was successful to say, I, I want to make America great again uh, with, the, with the coal miners in uh, Ohio and so on and so forth. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's ignorant, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a... It, it, history has not shown that ignorance uh, wins the day. Like, <laughs> ignorance can win a battle, it can win a presidential election. Um, but I really do believe, you know, what Martin Luther King said and Obama echoed so many times that the arc of history bends toward justice. And, um, there's no choice but to believe that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're really almost done. That's fine. Uh, last two questions. Um, of course, not, not everyone agrees with you vis-a-vis uh, -vis of the remnants. There was this, um, uh, a critique by Scranton about uh, uh, your, your point. I mean, what... I think that the main point, I mean, you, you made it very clear with me, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I will do my best to, to... The main point is that someone could say, huh, okay, you are saying the wrong culprit, uh, but, but then you, 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 have, you, have, you have already made clear that. But I think that someone in slight bad faith could say, huh, you say, look at the methane, uh, the methane and uh, yeah, but the other thing is more, more important, the CO2 things is more important. Don't you think that stressing so much one part, animal farming and the methane and so forth, could uh, in a way weaken uh, the, the, the more classical take on, on this problem, which is CO2, greenhouse gases? And how do you reply to the, to the critics of someone like Scranton? Well, or to your critics more in general? Well, I, would, yeah. I would agree with them. I mean, I would say, <laughs> I hope this doesn't. I, I don't think we have a limited amount of attention and that we take it out of. You know, I don't think most people are saying, okay, I'm going to um, not eat meat at lunch, but that means I won't be able to recycle my bags at home. It doesn't make any sense. It's not like we have a finite amount of energy to do these different things. My point is not that we should stop recycling or that we should stop buying hybrid cars. It's that we also need to do this, that we have no hope unless we also do this. Um, and that our mistake is not in paying attention to fossil fuels. Our mistake is in only paying attention to fossil fuels. You know, it's like I use the analogy in the book of um, if somebody had a heart attack, yeah. um, the doctor would be negligent if he said um, you need to uh, exercise more but didn't address the fact that the person smoked cigarettes, was stressful, and, you yeah. know, ate a cholesterol-heavy yeah. diet. So, you add on top of what, what is, what is uh, already done, you, you, you add a layer on, on that, in a way. But, but you also say, it's not, it's not exactly that, maybe you ought to say, Focus your attention on the most urgent uh, danger, which is methane and, and nitrous oxide. But do the most urgent. The other one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not only the most urgent; it's the one that we're most able to change in yeah. our own lives. Yeah. Yeah. So, readers of my book, yeah. very, very few of them are going to be in a position to, like, you know, uh, change, um, like, uh, gas mileage regulations. For cars, yeah. you know, very few of them are going to be able to um, participate in a lot of the other kind of changes that are talked about. And so the ways that they have been participating, yeah. like recycling, like air drying clothes, things that, are more ceremonial than hmm or symbolic, like that analogy in the beginning of the book to um, the airplanes that used to fly over America yeah. when there was literally zero possibility that a German plane yeah. would there. Yeah. Um, but it's not to say that it was stupid or unimportant. Yeah. It's only to say that if that were the only thing they were doing, it would have been stupid. 
but as a symbolic act to create a kind of a sense of camaraderie, a sense of uh, experience of the war, it could be really powerful. And I think that you know the recycling movement, the not using plastic straws, things like that, it um, engages people's sense of responsibility, even if it's not practically speaking doing anything too important. <laughs> but people whose sense of the thing about like a sense of responsibility or ethics more broadly, it's like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And people who. You know, some, I remember a critique that people would sometimes have with eating animals is, why should we care about animals when there are hungry people in the world? But there's yeah. you know, a million other problems. Yeah. And I would always say, yeah, you're, we should care about both. I don't think that people take their care from humans and bring it to animals. It's not. It's just the opposite, that when you start to care about one thing, you start to care about other things. And when you turn your eyes away from one thing, you tend to turn your eyes away from other things. So, you know, people who are socially engaged, ethically engaged, almost always become more deeply engaged and more broadly engaged. And people who, like, repress what they know tend to repress pretty comprehensively what they know. It's not easy to um, segregate those parts of ourselves. So there is a multiplier effect in a way. I mean, once you, you, you care about something, you multiply your attention to, to many other aspects. It's what you just described is the only hope. <laughs> It is really humanity's only hope that we're going to experience something in the next five years. Maybe it will start with high school students. Yeah. Maybe will you all, who knows, have a group of you know, politicians that really surprise us. <laughs> But we're going to get these triggers and it's going to... I mean, remember the fact that nobody had a smartphone, yeah. what, five years ago? Yeah. And now it is as ubiquitous as drinking water. It is almost impossible to imagine life without smartphones. Yeah. Right? Our entire culture, literally our, like, the anatomy of our brains, literally has been changed. Yeah. by this invent the way we think about time the way we think about news the way we think about friendship the way we think about expression the kinds of sentences we form our bodies the way we use our hands like, whoever would have thought that our thumbs would be like the most important you know parts of our body five years ago <laughs> humanity was like reborn or revolutionized yeah. not necessarily for the better yeah That kind of extreme, extreme change could happen and could happen that quickly. Um, and it will happen for the reason that you said of like the kind of multiplying effect. Um, I've, I've read that among the few politics that you give some uh, trust vis a vis of, of this topic, there is Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Am I correct? Yeah, she's wonderful. I mean, she, she is. Uh, uh, you know, single-handedly completely changed the conversation in American politics and has made the climate something that all, at least all Democratic presidential contenders have to talk about and have to talk about in pretty bold ways. But still, you think that, that the success of this struggle won't be much in the hands of, of the politician, rather on the hands of, of common people. Well, I think that if, we're, if we are actually to succeed, it will have to be both. Yeah. Um, I have maybe more faith. Yeah, you, see, you say grassroots, but also VIPs, in a way yeah. that can, can be an uh, example. From the bottom up and from yeah. the top down. Yeah. yeah, it has to be both. I think that they're not so distinct from each other, you know? If politicians feel that individuals, that voters, care about this, then they will start to care about it. And similarly, public figures have a way of influencing the culture. You know, people like Beyonce can get young people, in particular, thinking about things they might not otherwise have been thinking about. So it will happen in both directions. But, they're the, I mean, the Democratic candidates now 
are pretty bold about climate change. It's really inspiring. I never would have predicted, and it would not have been the case if, if Hillary had won. You know? Yeah. Yes. Maybe some of the merit must go also to, to Bernie Sanders in a way. Yeah, no? for sure. And Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, and Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, I think we have covered quite a lot of ground. Uh, very last question, in, in this precise moment, how confident or optimist are you that uh, a change will, will take place in the, in the near future? It's <laughs> funny, that comes up in the book, that question of like hopefulness and why we yeah. often talk yeah. about yeah. hopefulness. It's, it's really, it's uncanny how often <laughs> that question and I ask it myself you know if I ever have an opportunity to speak to somebody who specializes in yeah. like this field I, I will often end by saying just out of curiosity are you hope <laughs> so I don't know uh, there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful and there are a lot of reasons to be pessimistic to me that conversation that kind of generalized abstracted conversation can accidentally leave people feeling complacent. I find an interesting way to end is to speak very personally. Yeah. So like, you can ask me and I can ask you very directly, like, what do you think are your limits for change? You know, like you are obviously a smart person and you're a person with an audience and you didn't have to come here to do this, right? So like, what do you, if I can tell you about my sort of uninformed and vague ideas, predictions about what will happen very generally. But I'd be really interested to hear you talk about, like, you know, like, what do you think you would be capable of? Are you capable of taking one less flight a year? Are you capable of eating differently once a day or twice a day or three times a day? I think if we make the conversation about the two of us, we will each leave, I think, feeling inspired and also feeling that we now have one more witness, you know, even though I will never know what you do and you will never know what I do, simply having had the conversation makes you witnessed in a way that speaking broadly about others lets you off the hook. You know, I could say, I think we're going to pull it out. I think we're going to be okay. And you might feel kind of good and I might feel kind of good. And then we leave and we go live our lives as if nothing happened. But if next time I book a plane ticket or, you know, there's this thing called um, a quality called stickiness when it comes to memory. We tend to remember things that are sticky. They give us a reason to remember them. So um, what's your last name? Uh, Stegliano. Stegliano. So I have no hope of remembering that last name. <laughs> If I break it down, Stagliano, Stagliano. So Stag is kind of like stag, like a deer. <laughs> yeah. So I could, next time I try to think about you, I could imagine like a deer above your head. Um, or I could imagine um, a stag walking a line. Like stag <laughs> And I could try to remember your glasses, which are sort of a little bit... Um, unusual or memorable. So I start creating, adding more information, which makes it stickier. My brain now has like, it's like when you're climbing, it's very hard to climb something like this, yeah, yeah, but if it has little yeah, holes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with our own behavior, I think it's helpful to have like uh, handholds and footholds. So like two people talking creates a, a handhold. So next time I order something in a restaurant, I may not think about it consciously, although I might, But it might also just inform my subconscious. Like, I remember I had that conversation yesterday. I remember what I said. I don't really want to be the kind of person who says one thing and then does and then another. Does another. Yeah. So that makes it a little more sticky for me. And I think just as often as possible, forcing ourselves, compelling ourselves to have these conversations with others and with ourselves. I can't... I can't Nothing makes me more hopeful than that. That's what I would say. 
since I mean this was supposed to be last question, but since you quoted me, that's a very interesting point because me personally, uh, I I live a life which is very similar to the one you are advocating for, mm. meaning that I'm not strictly a vegetarian, but I behave like one. Mm. I eat meat maybe once a week or once a couple of weeks. Mm. Uh, I, I, I basically drink vegetables every every single day. I don't have a car. Mm -hmm. I, I have a Vespa, but which 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 is yes. not even comparable. Yeah. Uh, with, with ten bucks of gasoline, I can go uh, uh, ten days. I mean, yeah. it's a very small footprint. Well, I, I took many flights because that's my that's my job. That's the yeah. But. Even with my uh, dietary uh, regime, that it's, I mean, for Italians, I'm not the, the biggest exception. I, I'm an exception for American standards, uh, meaning that people here are crazy for, for meat and so on and so forth, and for big cars which swallow gasoline. But I mean, the fact that my friends are all like me, I mean, either to go on bike or with an e-bike, you know, or something, um, it's not enough. It's not enough that there is plenty of people like me in Italy. So probably, maybe I'm, I'm suggesting that, but maybe there should be different standards because for for Italy, or at least for my circle, which is not representative of Italy at all, but still, it's not what we are doing now. It's not enough. We should ramp up our engagement because otherwise we won't manage. As you said, as you said before, it's not either or. We, we have to do everything at once right now if we want to improve the situation. Because what you are advocating, it's a lot for the American standard, but it's not a lot for Italian or European standards because we tend to be more compliant to, at least uh, gastronomically speaking, at least for, uh, at yeah. the food level. So maybe your book is very, it's very bold for the, for the American readers. Uh, in a way, if I may say, it's not bold enough for, for some European uh, re readers because we already do many of the things you say. I don't know. I mean, because, you know, in the book, yeah. one of the points I really make yeah. is that eggs and dairy yeah. are yeah. almost yeah. as bad as meat. Okay. Okay. My yeah. guess is that the traditional yeah. Italian diet yeah. is yeah. very heavy in, yeah. Yeah. in dairy. Yeah. Um, also, you know, one transatlantic flight is the equivalent of eating vegan for like a year <laughs> so I appreciate it's your job yeah, but yeah. You, you, yeah. your carbon footprint yeah. my guess is quite a bit bigger than the average Americans yeah. because of your job yeah the problem is we all have reasons to say it's because yeah. of this it's yeah, because yeah, of yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know could we have conducted this interview on Skype we could have yeah. yes you know yeah. <laughs> I prefer it in person I'm sure you prefer it in yeah, person too yeah. but I also prefer, you know, having a biodiversity and have, like, so those are the kinds of decisions that yeah. we will have to make. And you're in a really cool position because, I mean, this is the other thing, we're all kind of in cool positions because we have different ways yeah, of like yeah. taking steps. You could say to your boss, yeah. I want to conduct my interviews yeah. by Skype yeah. from now on. And you could write a piece about it. Yeah. And every time you conduct a Skype interview, you could say, this interview was conducted by <laughs> Skype because the carbon footprint of the flight I would have taken yeah. is equivalent to uh, 100 Italians <laughs> recycling for a year. You know, whatever. Um, so, yes, without a doubt, Americans are the worst culprits in the world. <laughs> There's no getting around that. Um, and that's not any kind of a apology f yeah, yeah. for the American lifestyle. My only point is we have to like really examine ourselves in a way that can be painful and question the things yeah. that we assume are unavoidable or inevitable. Like, because you so quickly said, well, because of my job, I fly a lot. Yeah, yeah, Except yeah. that, you know, in those, in the, the four things, that are mentioned, having yeah. babies, yeah. flying, eating, and um, yeah, I don't, cars. I don't even have babies. So right. <laughs> so putting aside babies, <laughs> flying is far and away the worst. Yeah. Like really the worst. Um, 
So if you could take one or two less flights a year, you know. Yeah. I wish, in retrospect, we had conducted this interview by Skype, and then that could have been part. That could have been part of the story. But the nice thing about life is, until you die, there's a next time. You know, and it's, it can actually be quite inspiring. Yeah, I think it's it's a good ending of our conversation. Yeah, which which forced me to to question myself. Yeah, yeah. And of course, we human beings are very good in articulating some alibi, meaning that yeah, but but by being here, there's a high chance that the interview will come will come out better. So we will be able to to move a, a bigger piece of the 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 public opinion in the right direction that in a way counted the fact that I came here with the flight and I mean, I'm dealing with that I'm dealing yeah. with that right yeah. now with yeah. my uh, book tour because <laughs> yeah, you know if I, mean, I fly yeah. I can go talk to yeah. many many more yeah. people yeah. Yeah, yeah. but how, how will you be able? how will I do it yeah I'm going to fly as little as I can yeah. and I will fly some And I don't know how I feel about that. I have mixed, mixed feelings. <laughs> okay, wonderful, Good. wonderful. I'm, I'm very happy for, for this talk. Okay.